hike. <laughs> 10 o'clock rock, think tech, think tech, tech talks. Okay, we're going to have a, like a run, a, um, kind of a memory lane kind of show today. Yeah. Okay, with Cliff Spradlin. And Cliff Spradlin, let's have a shot of Cliff Spradlin. There he is. That's Cliff Spradlin. He's, oh, he's 31. 30. 30. 30. Sorry, I'll make you older yeah, than you yeah, are. Yeah. And I knew Cliff when he was one week old. And he was really a fantastic kid, even then. Really? Yeah, he was talking about code. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I knew you would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Back when, okay, when his parents, uh, Cliff and uh, and um, Phyllis, were next door to us uh, in our law firm in the Davies Building uh, 31 years ago. Yeah. And they were tax attorneys. Back then. That's right. Now, now Cliff is 31. He's got a life that we're going to talk about. He's got a wife and child outside. The whole thing has come full turn. It's really fabulous. Yeah. So nice to see you, Cliff. You too. Yeah. So I've changed. Yeah. Yeah. You've changed. You're, you know, you were like that. Now look at you. <laughs> so you got into computers, and that was right. That yeah. was a thing that really had to happen. That was a thing you were born for. We all knew at the time. Yeah. I, I have photos from when I was a kid. From like when I say kid, I mean when I was two or three, like using computers. Actually, Milo is now too. But oh, cool. um, yeah. How old is Milo? He's one and a half now. All right. There we go. Um, but. I think I just, I definitely fell into it. Uh, I didn't really pay attention at school, and I just played on computers all day, and then suddenly people started paying me for it. And so then I worked on video games, which is like a kid's dream come to, true, and uh, rocket software, and most recently, um, software for driverless cars or autonomous vehicles. Ah, I was talking about that. So tell us a little about how you evolved into the, into the world of software engineering, I mean, professionally. Um, well, I used to play video games, and um, I used to like pry into them to try to figure out how they worked, and I met friends online. The internet was pretty new at the time, but there was ways I could find um, people who were like MIT professors or um, just just programmers or software engineers on the internet. It's the, the perfect place to find other software engineers, right? It's the yeah, internet. Oh, sure. Well, sure. Um, what better place? Yeah. And, I, I, uh, remember, <laughs> I remember you came to our office back when, really? and you were either late teens or early 20s, and you told me you were working on the, and I didn't even know what it was at the time, the Android operating system. That's true. Uh, that was, I worked on the first Android phone ever, actually. Wow. Was, you had one. You yeah. showed it to me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it was so different. It was different for me, too. I, and I had been working on phones previously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now, now it's like... I don't know, maybe even more popular than the iPhone. So you're, you're at the top echelon of, um, you know, a project software engineers that can come and do things that are disruptive. I mean, at the front end, how did you get there? I mean, what makes it, why can't I do that? I, don't, I think you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I started just by learning how, how computers work at a very low level. Like, I wanted to really understand how video games work. And as it turns out, video games push the, the limits of computers, right, in every dimension, graphics and networking and just, like, simulation, right? Like, like Grand Theft Auto or something is a huge simulated world. Yeah. And basically, based on that experience, I was able to work on Rocket software. And it's, it's actually the same thing. It's the same kind of math, linear algebra, and uh, you need to simulate simulate a rocket going to space before you launch it. So, so is rocket really science really rocket science, or it isn't rocket science? You know, I worked at SpaceX, and I still don't know who was the rocket scientist. <laughs> I, I would probably say the people in the propulsion department, okay. the, like, to make the engines. Um, but then there's other people who just, like, you. it's not enough to make an engine, right? It has to go somewhere. So. I don't know. All right, well, <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. What about Tesla? You work with Tesla for a time. Um, yeah, so Tesla is amazing. Uh, Tesla is not like any other car company on the planet. Uh, they uh, have the hardware team and software team integrated. Uh, they try not to buy parts from external companies because it'll slow them down. Uh, and so, I love that. Yeah, so it's, it's like the perfect um, like uh, incubator for new technology, right? And Tesla's are full of new technology. Whatever you think you can do. Yeah, <laughs> and I've seen Tesla release something from concept to like in customers' hands on the, in the order of a month or less. Uh, that sounds um, like things that happen in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, they're trying to copy it. <laughs> You're not going to let them get a chance. Yeah. So now somehow you evolved all of this into autonomous cars, and I like yeah. it. Uh, oh, and you're working in, in the San Francisco. That's where you live right now. You have to live in Silicon Valley.
Valley. Why? <laughs> Why? Because that's where it's where all the energy is for um, new ideas and passion and uh, just it's everybody's worked at every other company in that area too. And so they move around. Yeah, they move around. So all the ideas spread like wildfire. Whenever somebody has an idea, everybody else starts working on it too. And the same thing is true with autonomous vehicles. Like there are dozens of companies in the Bay Area separately working on autonomous vehicles. Not technology. necessarily the big guys. Maybe little guys too. Little tiny guys you've never heard of to huge people like Apple secretly working on it. Well, secretly, but it's an open secret in the yeah, Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does it mean to work on software for an autonomous vehicle? I really want to spend time with you on yeah. that because it's so important. We know that it's going to happen. Right. We know that people will demand it. You know, the American psyche is in love with the car. Um, they're in love with the mm -hmm kind of car, but the macho car. But, you know, electric will take over. And part of electric, am I right? Part of electric is autonomous. They go hand in glove. I, I think it's nice because, you know, you can you can much more easily charge a car by having it drive over a pad. There's less yeah, mechanics involved, cool. things yeah. like that. Um, I've actually seen autonomous vehicle technology on gas cars, too. So it's not necessarily, it's oh. not necessarily linked. I'd say that there are two parallel but equally important steps ah. for cars to take. So it could happen before we have a you know, huge explosion of, of electric cars. Yeah. Could happen on gas cars. Yeah. Um, I would say that Tesla has made the first big step towards autonomous vehicle technology released to the public, yeah. and that's on an electric vehicle platform. So yeah. that's yeah. why it's, it's definitely got linked inside of people's minds. Well, that would, yeah, I would, I would link it, because you know, in the end, gas cars will go away. I mean, right, so right. much political pressure, or they used to be until January 20th. There used to be used to be political pressure for that. Now we'll have to see. But anyway, so what is it? You know, you have a brain yeah. uh, in the car, and the brain, what, what, is, what input is the brain getting? So the hardest part for, for this software is actually the perception, seeing the world, um, seeing that there's cars in front of you, where the lane lines are, um, making decisions about changing lanes, overtaking cars, taking exits. Um, actually, if you had a perfect view of the world, then driving the car is actually not that hard. Um, it's it's it actually uses very similar code to what you would write for a car in a video game. Uh, it's it's you know the car can only turn by its steering wheel and accelerate and decelerate. It doesn't have to do very much. Uh -huh. um, but the, so the really hard part is seeing what's around you, and so that's what all the new development's been on. And then as an extension of that, um, where are you? Yeah, that's actually another hard problem too. Um, and so the, the yeah, there's a graph graphic. What, oh, what is yeah. that? No, that's that's oh perfect. To what you're these are the these are the sensors of the, the first Tesla car. So um, what you see there is the, in the front of the car is there's a camera you can see in front of it. Yeah. There's also a radar. Um, the camera and radar have different pros and cons to them of what they can see in front of them. Uh -huh. And the kind of like peanut shaped uh, area around the car is actually its ultrasonic sensors, which are the same sensors used for parking your car. We repurpose them for sure. uh, just seeing what's around you. Just <laughs> they, they don't work as well at highway speeds, but they still work. Why all three? Um, okay, well, going straight, the most important thing in autonomous vehicles is not when hitting the car in front of you. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the, if, as long as you don't hit the car in front of you, you're kind of okay. Um, and so that the radar is exceptionally good at seeing metal objects in front of you, and that's what you've seen in cruise control and things like that. And you need the, the camera in order to see the lane lines. Radars can't see lines on the road. Suppose or the you have lines. lousy lane lines. Well, that is a huge problem. Um, and that's what the, the, the last, like the long tail of the development process is, because most of the companies working on this already do very well when they can see the lane lines. But when they start getting spotty and or disappear entirely, that's where it it starts getting into the realm of artificial yeah, intelligence. Maybe they should come to Hawaii because we have lousy lane really? lines. Really? Yeah, we can what about bumpy roads? Give them a great environment to do their laboratory. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> and bumpy roads. <laughs> well, so I mean you guys might not see it as 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 real as I see it because where I live I see autonomous vehicles all around me. I see Google's driverless cars every day just driving around me. Now they're autonomous, but they have safety drivers in them, just like holding the like their hands around the steering wheel. But the car is totally in control. It stops in front of the traffic lights. It makes turns. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because you remind me of a friend we used to have living in our house. Yeah, his name was Safety Man. Safety and Man. Say he was a stuffed doll. Okay. And we would sit him up in a couch while we were away, and, and people would look in the window and see oh. this <laughs> yeah. six foot five guy right. sitting on the couch in the living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was Safety. 
safety man. Well, in this case, the safety driver is actually doing something because <laughs> so the, the software is not perfect yet. And that's the last bit of development is what happens if like a cat jumps in front of you or there's a baby on top of a bed of leaves. Like mm -hmm. our software might think it's a bed of leaves or it's a baby. It's actually hard for it to differentiate and say it's actually both. Yeah, you have to teach it. Yeah, you have to teach it. And that's where you get in the artificial intelligence from. So but let's, uh, let's go back to yeah. the lanes. I mean, you know, one question that strikes me, it's always struck me about autonomous cars is that maybe we need to rebuild the infrastructure in this country yeah. and put in magnetic lines or, you know, reflecting radar uh, uh, devices and otherwise give the car some guidance yeah. as to where to go. Is that is that going to happen? Is that necessary? Uh, it's not necessary, but it will improve things. We, we just think that infrastructure will take too long. It's going to be too slow. And expensive. On the order of decades, yeah, right? Yeah. So we're just going to preempt it by making software that can just see things as humans do. And that's why we have to focus on cameras. Um, so because people see things with cameras, or, well, cameras are like human eyes. Um, and uh, we'll just have to make do on any road. Uh, and later, I think the, the most important infrastructure development would actually be um, for traffic lights. Because detecting a red light is actually hard for both a person and a car. And a dog. And a dog, yeah, they'll just cross, right? <laughs> but in the future, you could imagine that each intersection will just broadcast its current status remotely. And then you don't have to worry about the accuracy of seeing the traffic light. Well, actually, that's, you know, to me, that's a thing whose time has come. Yeah. If you look around this country, you find very few modern traffic lights, modern traffic sensors and signals. You know, we're going to have to lay out the bucks. We're going to have to upgrade all our traffic signals, I agree. especially in Hawaii, and this could be part of it. So, you know, you've got to get to a point where you can hit that on a historical curve where, where these municipalities, you know, find it necessary to put in new new infrastructure. That's when you nail them right. for infrastructure that will help on autonomous cars. I actually talked to Caltrans about this very topic, and they're, Caltrans is the California Transportation Department, um, and they're so interested in this because they're always doing 20-year planning, and they know that autonomous vehicles are the future. So they want to know now from the companies that are working on it, what does it take? Good for them. Yeah. Good for you for talking to them. Yeah. And they'll set the standard for the rest of the country because once you so. roll this out and new, who's working on the traffic signals? Are the same people who are working on the cars working? On, are you working on the traffic signals? Uh, well, I I didn't personally work on the detection of the traffic signals, but um, it's it's the same group of people that are doing everything. Yeah. Transportation software engineers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it combines a lot of different fields. Yeah. I've learned a lot just as a software engineer about the, the chemistry of, tr of lane lines on the road <laughs> and the types of lines there are. And there's some places where there's bumps instead of lines. It's just, it's kind of endless, but computers have to learn every single one of those things. <laughs> I hope you're making <laughs> notes because this is the talk of the future. These are the issues that are being resolved <laughs> and will change your lives. We're talking about major disruption in our world of transportation and energy for that matter. We're gonna take a short break. You can think about it, you know, make some notes, come back in one minute. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward, and the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon, and let's move Hawaii forward. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Bingo, like <laughs> MacArthur, I told you we'd be back and we're back. Cliff Spradlin and me, he's the software engineer par excellence, going to change the world, change the country, change transportation. You'll see. Remember the name, Cliff Spradlin, I'm telling you now.
Write it down. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> okay, so we got we got a picture. Let's look at the picture of the van. This is the autonomous van, so to say. Right. So this is Google's. Now they've spun off into a sub company called Waymo. This is their collaboration with um, the Chevy Pacifica platform or Chrysler Pacific Pacifica platform, and. Uh, you'll see a lot of additions to the normal car, right? There's <laughs> this looking. huge thing on top. Yeah, what is that? It's a lot of different things, and actually the insides of it are a secret, and I haven't worked at Google, so I don't know anything. <laughs> but what they've told us is that there's a laser radar on top, a LiDAR, uh -huh. um, which is different from a radar. There's... Uh, LiDAR is... How is it different? Does it bounce back or not? It does bounce back. It's just... It's like a laser that just comes right back. Okay. Um, and so you can get actually a very good 3D view of the whole world and it's actually something that's spinning around in the top continuously uh, okay. but it's safe for human eyes from what I understand <laughs> okay. I've had one right Burn next out to your retina yeah there, there's a little eye warning on them oh, but, but they say it, it's okay okay um, and then there's just a ton of cameras um, and all of these sensors are designed to handle like uh, the corner cases of this um, this problem. So, like when you're making a turn on an intersection, um, what's in your blind spot? Autonomous vehicles just don't have blind spots. Yeah, that's great because I know I do, and yeah. I'm always trying to check my blind spot. And sometimes I don't even see what's in my blind spot. And that's the other thing is that one of their advantages is they can look everywhere at the same time. Yeah, right, and integrate. Yeah. So, um, but here, I mean, just just comes to mind. I mean, you know, you can drive in New England, and one one all of a sudden there'll be a fog. Yeah. It'll kind of roll in from the ocean on little cat feet, right. in the words of Carl Sandburg. Okay, and you can't see anything. Human Humans being. can't see anything. Humans can't see anything, right? Yeah, so what happens? Well, that's why our different kinds of sensors um, help out, because um, our cameras won't be able to see just like people do. But LiDAR and radar can see through fog just fine. Um, well, depending on how foggy it is, right? <laughs> but okay. in that kind of situation, you probably don't want to keep driving anyway. Uh -huh. So the important thing is to always pull over to the side of the road in a safe way. So that's one of the core aspects of this, is to always have an escape plan. Yeah, well, uh, you know, and I also, I also would imagine that there'd be a little voice in there saying, you know, Cliff, do you think you ought to drive now? It seems to be foggy past a certain yeah. percentage of precipitation. Why don't you pull over? Well, that that's something that will happen in the new, near future, but in the far future, I would expect there to not be a steering wheel. Um, and so what we're thinking about now is what... It'll pull over for you? Yeah, well, it will of pull course, over for you. <laughs> yeah, but then what should it do? Are you stuck, or should it be able to keep driving a little bit forward? Calls for an Uber. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, actually, Uber is one of the huge players in this. Is that they've, right? Yeah, okay. they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this. Good for them. Um, it's they huge. see into the future. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they just want to replace all of their drivers with uh, autonomous vehicles. Yeah, no labor issues. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the most expensive part of a taxi service. You sure. know, they're subsidizing the cost of their service heavily now, and I think they just want to replace the humans with robots so that instead of having to subsidize it, now it just costs that much yeah. and just put everyone else it's, out of it's business. It's a perfect idea. Yeah, it and is. they'll advance this technology for sure. Yeah, and actually, the Uber cars in Pittsburgh, if you, if you reserve an Uber, there's a chance that you'll be picked up by an autonomous vehicle today. In Pittsburgh? Yeah. Pittsburgh is ahead of the game. Pittsburgh is where Carnegie Mellon is, and Uber basically bought a team of roboticists and autonomous vehicle people from Carnegie Mellon and opened up shop next door. And so that's where they are. And that's where some, somehow Pittsburgh is like the forefront of this. Okay, put me in yeah. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Okay, I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm standing in front of my house. I, I call an Uber. The Uber drives up. What's my experience like? Um, well, it's you just get in, and it just takes you there. The back seat, not yeah, the back front seat, seat. Back seat. There is no front seat. No. Well, there's no no. Okay, so there's still a safety driver, but all they're doing is watching, right? Oh, there is a driver, but he's not. He's okay. We're, we're yeah. moving. We're evolving into no driver. So it'll probably take people estimate four to five years to get real approval to have no driver in the car. And yeah. what, what the industry has to demonstrate that it's at least as safe as humans. Yeah. Right. And there's a big conversation about is as good as humans good enough or should it be two times as good as humans three times as what good? do you think it can be better it can be better but what's the minimum it takes before it's allowed to be on the road yeah, and then it's governmental issue well it will definitely improve some things right like it, it's definitely going to be better than drunk driving or driving if you forgot your glasses at home or like let's say I, I actually have heard of one case in a Tesla where somebody was hurt and they had to drive themselves to the hospital and they used the autopilot feature to stay in lane on the highway on 
on the way there. there if they go. didn't, they were just like dazed and confused the it whole saved way. saved them. And that's just a limited form of autonomy. Yeah. Well, this is definitely going places. Yeah. So I get in the back seat. Yeah. Um, I tell the Uber where I want to go. Yeah. Is, is it listen no, no, electronically? No, 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 no. You put the Uber destination oh, in from I, the start uh, on the oh, app, okay, right? Oh, okay, right. The app. You don't have to say a word. Yeah, I don't have to say a word. Okay, and then I get in the back seat. It knows it's me. Yeah. It pulls out and it just goes. I don't have to talk to the safety man either. No, no, no. He, he's, he's almost irrelevant now. Yeah, yeah. It will, he'll disappear soon enough. <laughs> Disappearing safety yeah. man. Yeah. Okay, so then it takes me to my destination. Uh, and like Uber now, I don't, I don't have to worry about money. It bills okay. me later on my credit card. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So uh, how do I feel about this? I mean, do I do I feel confident? Do the people in Pittsburgh feel confident? Yeah, very confident. Um, they, but then they always have the safety driver just in case. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of the problem is right now there's a divide between assistance and full autonomy. Um, and unless you're a trained safety driver, it may be so good that you don't realize that you need to take over right. in, in critical situations. Right. And so I think there's going to be a big jump where we 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 intentionally don't release something that's in between those the assistance and full autonomy because it could you know, be too people dangerous. People get yeah. complacent. That's Complacency the, is a real thing. Yeah, After yeah. about 15 minutes of perfect driving, pretty much anybody will just stop and paying attention. And begin to go confident on it. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about the sensors and you talked about the car learning everything in yeah. all directions and all this. And I suppose, you know, there's other ways, other kinds of information that could be fed to the car. For example, um, if it's going to rain, if the temperature is going to drop below, it's going to be icy. Yeah. Reports of traffic jams, all that stuff that we, we know we can get. Yeah. And it feeds it to the car. And the car now, you know, does something with its brain. We call that routing decisions. Routing decisions. And it makes those, just like if you get in and have, uh, you know, one of those, what do you call it, navigation systems right now, or yeah. use the one on your phone. Um, now the brain is is putting a lot more data into that and making decisions about. Well, about you can routing. see how Google's very well poised to make this happen because they already have all that information right. for just humans. Just lumped it up, yeah. yeah. And Google Earth, my God, you get everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but the question is, I mean, are we, are you confident right now the sensors, I mean, are the sensors ahead of the brain or is the brain ahead of the sensors? Because it's two separate things. Well, I would say the sensors are ahead of the brain, although it's important to know that cameras are not the same as human eyes. There's a lot of deficiencies. Um, compared to a hum the human's vision system. But I would say that the problem is the software. Because if you look at an image from a camera, mm you almost always know what to do, right? You could probably drive the car based on like a camera in front of the car and yeah. drive just as well as you do seeing the road. Yeah, yeah. So it's all about the software now. Yeah. And cameras are getting better. I mean, you yeah. know, what did I hear that iPhone has 800 people working on the camera all the time? I think it, that's right. It's getting better and better and better. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's like you, you just wait for wait for it to be developed somewhere else and then, right. you know, uh, coattail on that technology. Okay. So we're talking about the intelligence now. Yeah. How does it work? It's more than a case statement. It's more than it's more than anything we can imagine right now. It's 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 running headlong into the future of software, right? It's it's actually very different from any kind of software I've written before because you don't write code. You don't write say if this condition then do that. You don't do that at all. You train it just like you would train a person. You have to design what the the structure of the neural network would look like, um, but then you feed it images like of roads and cars, and you tell it at the same time you say this is a car on this road. Here is the lines, and it learns that um, by it's almost by probability. It's like this is most likely this. So, like if you if you have something that's like a stop sign detector, right? A stop sign is usually red, right? And so, if you're trying to decide is this a stop sign or not a stop sign, then this neural network can quickly figure out that the presence of red in the image is a pretty strong indicator, right? Yeah. And it builds on this, but to a point where we don't even understand it. it, it there, it's just like a human brain; we don't understand how it works. So of like Space Odyssey 2000. <laughs> how? How? What are you doing? How? Right. Well, it makes bugs really difficult, right? Because if, oh, yeah. Yeah, it does something wrong. You don't know why. And the only thing you can do is train it with counterexamples of, like, here's pl situations that are similar. You should follow this this yeah, yeah. different situation. So you take it to school. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, in, in, the, in the same way that kids and people do, it has it's not perfect in its way. You know, when you write software, it 
will always do the thing you tell it to. Yeah. Um, but the problem with software and and the roads is there's too many situations to account for with software and logic. You need something like a human brain to handle all the different situations. Right. To learn. Yeah. To get to, to learn. To account, account for all those situations and and build it in. I mean, it gets it gets it gets pretty big, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, how big? How physically big is the brain? Uh, well, so the, there's been a lot of work done to miniaturize the, the amount of computing hardware necessary, but yeah. the, the resources are massive. Um, but actually, we've been able to pick up, piggyback on graphics cards meant for games because they massively distrib distribute the, the problem amongst hundreds of little processors on a chip. Um, and those work really well for this problem, as it turns out. Especially because you have a lot of images and you got to exactly. recognize it's the images. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's just images. Um, but now uh, that, that uses a lot of power. And for a car power, especially an electric car, sure. power is a problem. Yeah. So now a lot of work's being done to make that like special, dedicated neural network processors mm -hmm. that only do this. Right. So you don't waste anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, I'm mean, really wondering um, how dependent the the car and the safety of the car is on the computer. In other words, is there a fail safe here? Yeah. If the whole thing goes down, if there's a you know, how about a bolt of lightning comes down and interrupts the the electrical system or somebody does it intentionally huh? yeah um, does the car know enough to say well gotta pull over that's it we're finished now so the way this is usually designed is um, there's something that's not the, the neural network not the AI kind of like a lizard brain <laughs> a lizard brain yeah, okay that always primitive <laughs> yeah that always has a plan of what to do in case the the higher level cognition fails yeah, really yeah, that's how we design the yeah, system yeah. and we also designed it to be electrically redundant um, in case there's like a brownout or lightning strike, everything is redundant. So um, if the, the higher level system just stops publishing information, you'll always just pull over to the side of the road. I love it. I love it. And to say nothing about all the information you're going to get about weather and, and ice on the road and who knows what about yeah. everything which can be integrated. So one minute left, okay? okay? What is your vision? When is this going to happen? How is it going to affect us? Okay, so I think the thing that will affect us most is all these people who will no longer have jobs. It's over three million truck drivers in America, there's many states where the number one job is truck driver. And trucking is the easiest thing for autonomous vehicles to do. They just have to, you don't even have to go to the end points, right? You could just drive on the highway and that would eliminate a lot of jobs. Just and, like just like Uber. Yeah, right, just like Uber. So how will society react to, um, these jobs are going away and not coming back. I don't think it's going to be like the industrial revolution or, or other times when technology has uh, like deprecated old jobs and people have found new ones. I don't think that's going to happen this time so are people going to get basic income are they how will we support people and how will they be happy without a job wow wow from from engineer to social engineer <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, we think about this a lot because we realize the impact we're going to have on the world and it seems like it's going to be a net plus but it's it's definitely going to change society fabulous i'm ready okay thank you cliff thank you. wonderful to see you and to have this discussion stimulating man. <laughs>